Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Billy Keels, the host of the Going Long Podcast. Freedom. Every week I'm going to be here interviewing the absolute best in the business as it relates to real asset investing, as well as real Main Street investors. We're going to be having conversations where you can listen in and that's going to help you to continue on your path to education so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident in investing long distance. So make sure that you, uh, that you go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Make sure that you're liking it as well because that way you can get every single episode as soon as it comes out. And by the way, don't forget to leave today's episode a five-star review. Let's go ahead and listen to today's conversation. Welcome to the Going Long Podcast. We're back once again to continue to help to educate you so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident in investing beyond your backyard. I'm your host, Billy Keels. And you know, if you've ever wanted to know what it was like to go from four single family residences to nearly a billion dollars of assets under management, and more importantly, being able to live every single day your life's purpose, then this is the show, the show that you're absolutely going to want to listen to until the very end, because today's guest really needs no introduction, but he is the proud father who was able to marry the love of his life. Uh, he's living out his life's purpose, as I mentioned to you before, helping people to achieve financial success. He's also a three-time best-selling author, uh, and one of the books that I absolutely love, which is the uh, Best Ever Apartment Syndication book, and he is the co-founder of Ashcroft Capital. I'd like to welcome to the show today, Joe Fairless. Joe, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, and I'm honored to be here. appreciate it. Okay, it's awesome. So I really, uh, really appreciate you, and I know you're going to be able to add loads and loads of value to uh, all of the Going Long audience. So, um, Joe, one of the things we like to do here, and we have kind of five standard questions, and then everything else will depend on kind of what our conversation is about. But first thing is really to help those people that are not in the U.S. Can you help us understand what city you live in? I live in Cincinnati, Ohio. All right. Fantastic. So uh, the, the Buckeye State, I think most people know I'm from Ohio as well. So um, <laughs> cool. And, and Joe, can you share with us, what is the most positive thing that's happened to you in the last 24 hours? Well, today, as we're recording it, is a Monday. And yesterday, I had uh, my wife's side of the family over to our house. Her parents, um, her sister, her uh, sister's husband, one of their kids, and her two uncles, uh, and we all hung out. We played um, through, uh, I, I never played lacrosse when I was growing up. I, I grew up in Texas, and lacrosse wasn't a thing. So I don't know if you say we threw the lacrosse ball around, because we didn't really, we, I, I say we slung it, but I don't know if that's right or not. <laughs> but anyway, with my, with my nephew, I was slinging the lacrosse ball around. Um, we were watching some football that was on and, you know, all hung out, had, di had dinner, uh, some homemade lasagna that uh, we, well, really, we, not me, uh, my wife made, um, I, I won't take credit for it, it was delicious. Um, and just hung out, it was, it was good family time, so I, I enjoyed that a lot. Fantastic. So thank you for sharing that with us. And many times it is being able to spend the time with the people that you want to spend the most. And, um, and so thank you for sharing that. And by the way, Joe, I've never played lacrosse either. So I have no idea if it's slung it through it or, or <laughs> yeah. whatever. So well, it's, it's great. No one's here to fact check. Right. Exactly. Even better. <laughs> it, it is what it is. It is what it is. So, it so listen, is bliss. there you go. So listen, Joe, so I've uh, shared just some of the highlights, uh, things that I thought were, would be important and the, that the audience would want to know, but can you give us a little bit more about uh, about your backstory for those very few people in the universe who don't know who you are right so um i was previously a w-2 employee and um when i i moved from texas to new york city whenever i graduated college and i was uh, working in advertising i wanted to compete with the best of the best in advertising so um, in the United States, uh, that is the perception that the best of the best in advertising live in New York City. So I moved straight up there, made, was making $30,000, and I uh, was living in East Flatbush, Brooklyn, uh, which at the time, statistically speaking, was the busiest police precinct in all the five boroughs of New York City. Uh, so it was a challenging area to live in. And I uh, was, I had student loans of about eight, $18,000 and 
Um, my check every two weeks was about $750. I don't quite remember the exact amount, but my rent was about the same. So basically I had about 750 bucks a month to uh, live off of after rent was paid. Uh, so not a whole lot to get ahead. Um, so what I ended, up, I ended up doing is I um, ended up doing a couple things. One, I was uh, focused completely on my career. And as a result, I climbed the corporate ladder relatively quickly. And then two, I was working on the weekends. Uh, so I worked at a daycare in college and I started doing that on the weekends. Uh, I would call it manning, not nannying, but a manning. And I would do that for some families on the weekends and I'd get extra money there. I'd get paid about 15 bucks an hour or so. And uh, what that allowed me to do is eventually save up to buy my first property. And it was in Texas. Uh, so even though I was living in New York City, I uh, was I bought my first house in Texas and I actually bought it sight unseen um, for me personally. Now I had uh, my real estate agent and an inspector see it, but uh, I did not ever visit it. And in fact, the four single family homes that you mentioned in the intro, I never visited uh, previ prior to purchasing them. And uh, I, one, at least one of them I never visited in person at all. Uh, and I, I've since sold those single family homes. I, so I sold one of them early on because it was ugly duckling. And then I sold three other ones, the last three, uh, about a year ago, almost exactly. And did very well, made $100,000 on each of the three when I sold them because of the appreciation of them. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Along the way, though, the reason why I was selling the single family homes is I wanted to scale my business and or scale my investments. And I realized that with the single family homes, I was making about 200, 250 bucks a month on each of them. But then the reality is when someone would move out, I'd have to pay about $5,000 to get it to be moving ready again. And they don't really talk about that a lot when yeah. you talk to single family home investors. And that wipes away the entire year and a half worth of profits when you're making only 200, 250 bucks a month on the ouch. home. Ouch. So yeah, great from appreciation, yep. but mm -hmm. yeah, ouch on the cash flow. Yep. So I realized from a cash flow standpoint, I needed a scale. And I realized that um, in the, around 2012 mm -hmm. or so. Yeah, 2012. And so that's whenever I... I decided, you know what, I'm going to make a jump. I'm going to exit out of my single, uh, I exit out of my W2 job. I was no longer fulfilled. I'm a huge fan of Tony Robbins. He talks about um, growth, and growth. growth and contribution. You got it. Yeah. And I didn't, didn't feel like I was growing. wasn't mentally stimulated. So I moved on and um, formed Ash. Well, actually I bought a property that lost money and I pay back my investors uh, plus 14% annualized return out of my own pocket. That was my first uh, big deal. Mm. Learned a lot of lessons and then um, formed Ashcroft with my business partner and uh, off we went and things have gone pretty well. We've got, as you mentioned, about a billion in, in assets under management right now. Okay. That, that's fantastic. So having the, getting to the point where you're at, the, at around the billion in assets under management, I guess most importantly, and one of the things I'd love for us to touch on is really you're living your life's purpose, right? Because that goes beyond that. But just a, a couple of things that you talked about. So you were in the W2 jobs, like so many people that are, are listening to us today, um, you were able to do something that was fulfilling your, your, your heart in terms of working with the, working with the, with the kids. And I think they were calling you Mr. Joe or, around that time. Mm -hmm. and, yep. and, all, and also you being able to um, have that experience, also aggregate capital, and then be able to start to put you in your uh, into your first property. And I also too living here in Barcelona about my very first property back in the states, and pretty pretty similar story. Um, and so, what when one of the things that you've been kind enough to share with us, Joe, is you talked about your very first multifamily property, I think you said, and it was, it sounded like you said where you lost money on the investment. And and it, I think it would be interesting to find out. Because when you get to a lot of the, the success, you, you went through this point where it didn't work out. And in spite of that, you kept going. So maybe you could tell us 
what happened there and what made you realize you wanted to keep going down this path? Yeah, I, yeah, ultimately I identified the issue. Um, and, you know, in any problem that we come across in any challenge, whether it's just something wrong with our vehicle or if it's, you know, something wrong with a uh, business, you've got to identify what's wrong here because if others have had success, let's just do a car for an example. Yeah, I was going to say, if, how do you, how do you do that? How do you do that? Exactly? Yeah. I mean, if let's just use in a car or, and by the way, I'm not a mechanic and would never play one on TV. <laughs> Me neither. That all. makes two of us. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so great. Another place where I can talk where we don't have to fact check <laughs> um, with, with a car, for example, you know, if, if it's not running properly, but you see other people on the road in their cars, you know that, hey, there are vehicles that work. And in fact, say you have a Toyota Corolla. I see another Toyota Corolla on the road. Boom, boom, boom. There's multiple of them. And they're going from point A to point B. Mine's not. What's wrong with mine? Because I know it's possible because I see other Corollas in this example that are actually accomplishing what they're made to accomplish. And, and that, that's the same thing with business. So with apartment syndication, my business, uh, the area I focus on, you know, ba basically just, and just to uh, quickly define it, it's, it's apartment syndication is investing with uh, passive investors. You're an active investor. You're overseeing the project and doing all the work. Um, they are passively investing. So they simply put up the money, they qualify the deal, put up the money, and then they, um, they, they participate in the profits. Yep. So, so when, uh, when I took a look at that first deal, I realized that, okay, it's possible that this business model works, but why didn't it work for me here? Mm -hmm. And the answer after looking at that, that way was, well, it was because of me. <laughs> um, it was because I was attempting to do all the areas of the business myself. Mm -hmm. uh, from, and there are main, three main components of the business. There's hundreds of sub bullets underneath these three main components, but okay. the three main components of the business, uh, you got to have the money, you got to have the deal, and you got to be able to execute. And I was good at the money and the deal, but the execution part was where I was below average to not good at. And uh, so I realized that in order for me to uh, get through this, I needed to change the model or change how I approach the business. And that's whenever I, I mentioned earlier that I partnered up with someone who had that level of expertise that was required. Because as we were talking about earlier, my background was working at an advertising agency in New York City and watching kids on the side to make extra money. It was not uh, working at an apartment community, overseeing the management, overseeing construction management. That's just not my area of expertise. I didn't grow up doing that and I didn't have any experience. So I ignorantly thought that I could uh, oversee a property management company correctly on my first deal. I wouldn't be doing the management, but I could oversee them. But there's a lot of expertise that's required in order to effectively oversee a property management company. So that's the main thing I realized. And fortunately for anybody in business, if we approach the, the problem solving process that way, and we're honest with ourselves about what's really wrong, then we can solve whatever we need to solve for assuming that that business, that type of business has been successful for other people. And, and so when you make that, the, the, taking that into account, right. And understanding that the, if a, a certain business has been successful for others, then it's possible for someone else to do it. But there are a couple of things that um, you're talking about now, where, and it makes me think of Jim Collins when he talks about face the brutal facts, right. And you need to be able to do that when you are going through this identification of the, of the problem areas or the issues. And, and I love the fact also too, Joe, that you had the wherewithal, um, the, the, the self-awareness of really understanding, okay, where the uh, issue lied 
and I love hearing that when, when you went through it, you recognize that it sat with you and the specific skill set that you had. And as a result of identifying those different issues, you went out and found uh, someone who could continue to, could help to, to, um, to make the team stronger, ultimately to click on all three cylinders, not only the money, the, the deal, but also the execution. Yeah, so, I, 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 that's a great summary. I mean, the, the a challenge that I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs have who have not uh, had successful businesses is that they um, either aren't self-aware enough or they don't simply ask others for their opinion on what needs to change uh, and then approach accordingly, assuming that they're informed opinions. Okay. And so look- uh, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly looking to, to improve. Okay. And, and you know, you talked about uh, Tony Robbins earlier and we, as soon as you talked about it, like the growth and, and growth and contribution are two of the six, right. That we, that most people talk mm-hmm. about. And wh- why do you think others don't look to understand when you're aspiring to be um, successful? entrepreneurs? Um, I think, I think it's, it's based on the individual, but there's a, a couple uh, off the cuff. My just, my off the cuff answer mm-hmm. would be, uh, two things I might, that's what my guess would be these two things, uh, that a lot of people would fit into. And one is uh, tunnel vision. You're really good at one aspect of the business and you love to focus on that aspect. And as a result, uh, you don't enjoy other aspects and those other aspects are one that eat you alive. Maybe, you know, uh, the accounting or the bookkeeping or s- something, um, you know, sales or whatever. And then the other is that people are lazy. I mean, generally speaking, people are uh, lazy uh, and want instant gratification. I mean, that's, that's how the world is right now. People want instant gratification. And I mean, you've done at least 38 podcast episodes. I mean, you've, you've taken the idea and you've implemented it and you're doing it. Whereas, you know, uh, Apple podcasts or I, it's not iTunes anymore. Is it? It's like Apple podcasts. Apple podcasts yeah. yeah. It's, it's full of, of podcasts that have about, you know, one to four episodes and they just stop because it's actually work and, and you're doing it consistently. I've been doing it. My team now has been doing it consistently and that's what it takes uh, so I think it's, it's one of those two things generally, mm-hmm. uh, I'm sure there's other, other reasons too, that I haven't thought of though. Okay. And I, I appreciate you sharing that. And yeah, definitely one of the things is get that feedback really quickly, understand what works and, and also being able to recognize where your strengths are, being able to stay in the lane that is most appropriate for you and make sure that your team members are able to also be in the lane, understand what is expected and needed of them so that everyone can perform at their highest level. And, and, and it's a great example that you use just the podcast. It wouldn't ever be possible with just me doing it would never happen. Um, so, so thanks for, for sharing your, your, your thoughts on that. So, you know, and we're talking about kind of process, right. And being able to, um, being able to, um, continue to grow and be able to make uh, impact on others. And I guess, Joe, what, what would you say are, have been some of the, um, biggest, uh, I guess the biggest area of, of focus or success to help you scale, because to be able to do what your company has done in such a, a, a short amount of time, and I'm sure you probably wish it could go faster. Um, that has to un- do with, with the core the team, the process and understanding, but maybe you could talk to us a little bit about some of your key processes. Well, uh, it's, I mean, it's clearly going to be finding the right partners and, and team members. Uh, so really it's a matter of how do you qualify them and what's an approach to take that might be helpful for others. And, um, I'll tell you about a guy who cut mows our yard at my lake house. And the reason why I'll mention this gentleman is because it applies to, uh, my philosophy for how I grow uh, or how we've grown the business. And so we have a lake house it's about 60 minutes east of where we live. So it's a short drive, uh, but you know, we don't mow our lawn there. We hire someone. And uh, this person uh, 
uh, does a, a pretty good job, but he's connected with a bunch of other people in the area so that when we do have an issue that I can go to this person and he can help me connect the dots to get whatever result. And a lot of people are saying, why are you still going with this gentleman? His name's Lynn. Why are you still going with Lynn? Um, and there's a lot of complaints where, you know, his wife does the billing and, uh, sometimes she doesn't know if he doesn't mow the lawn. So sometimes he'll get billed a couple extra cuts when you shouldn't get billed a couple extra cuts. And he's kind of like probably about $5 more than the others. Um, but I've always believed that it's important to have allies in areas that you don't put as much focus in as others. So I would rather have someone who I know is well connected and um, will have my back if I need it uh, and pay a little bit more as a result of that in order to um, feel comfortable and shore up that area. And so what happened one time, uh, my wife was pregnant. I was actually, she was about, uh, she was like a, a couple weeks before she gave birth. Uh, it was in the winter and a tree, uh, there was an ice storm at the lake and a tree fell down and crashed into the side of the house. And we didn't know about it. We didn't have cameras up there at the time we do now. And uh, this gentleman told us about it and he said, you know what? I got it. I'll take care of it for you guys. And uh, he got the tree chopped up and, you know, got the, the side repaired and, and everything. And that to me, we paid him for it, by the way, it wasn't free, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he, he, he was looking yeah. out for us. Yeah. Um, and that to me, that peace of mind, having an ally versus a long mowing company that just comes through, mows it, does a good job and then leaves. I like having an ally and I'll pay a little bit more for that. I'll call it a partnership mm -hmm. because it's an area that I don't put focus on as much and I need shored up. And mm -hmm. so that's my philosophy with business. Um, I want to bring on allies. I want to bring on team members and I'll pay a premium for it. Uh, and, uh, but I'll also give them more responsibility as a result of it. And that's something I learned from uh, my advertising days. I was the seventh employee at a company that was called Mr. Youth at the time. And uh, now it's called MRY. I was bought out. The owner of the company made a bunch of money. I was a seventh employee at the time when I, when I got hired and there were over a hundred or 150 employees when I left. So I saw that company grow big time and I was a part of it. Hmm. And I didn't participate in the buyout, by the way. I, I, I was, a, you, you, uh, were I was my, you were a, in my mind. Yeah, no, I was just a low, low person on the totem pole, uh, relatively speaking. But um, although I got promoted about four or five times in that five or six years I was there, okay. but I, I saw that what he did is he would bring on uh, people who had, who were talented people, didn't have the, the um, qualifications in terms of number of years in the industry, mm -hmm. but uh, were very talented and he paid them more for what they would have made elsewhere, but, um, uh, it, it, and it gave them that opportunity for growth. So that's the philosophy I like to take. And as a result, it, it, it made us very loyal to him because, uh, we couldn't have got those opportunities elsewhere and we were making really good money relative to what we could have made in other places and it made us work harder and it made everyone have a team culture. And so it's, it's, a uh, it's something I hadn't really talked about before. Um, but it's, it's something that is, uh, has helped fuel our growth, having that mindset. You know, and I think that that's great being able to have those experiences and then it's directly impacting the way, Joe, that you actually go out and look for other members of your team in the, in the premium that you are willing to, um, and I guess invest in more than anything else to be able to have that peace of mind. Um, mm -hmm. so, and, and I think that is, that that's phenomenal. And you, you just talked about one thing and, and maybe we can kind of look at this to, as we begin to wrap things up, but you talked about 
growing. And I know that growth and contribution is a really big thing for you. Um, I know that you do a number of uh, events, you've, you've published books, but, but maybe you can, if you would uh, just share with us this focus on growth and contribution um, and, and how that will play out as you look forward, growing your, um, growing your, your influence, growing your, your company through others, kind of how will that continue focus on growth and contribution be played out in the next, let's say two or three years moving forward for you? Well, I mean, it's, it's the, it's what makes it all worth it. I mean, you mentioned I'm doing my life's purpose. I don't know if I am doing my life's purpose right now, hmm. but I'm pretty, pretty close to it. I mean, I, I feel really good about what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if I'm, I've hit it dead on yet. What, 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 but keep, I know, what keeps you short of that, of not doing that? Um, I, I think, um, I, well, I guess if I knew I would be able to course correct a little bit, um, so I don't know. I don't, I don't, I can't answer that question directly cause I okay. don't know the answer. Okay. Um, but I know that everything I do, everything I've done in my career, I'm getting closer and closer to it. I mean, I, I was making $150,000 salary and I left the advertising industry for zero. So, I mean, I, and I made, I started with 30,000. I climbed all the way up to 150. And then I just, I sent an email to my family said, I'm going to leave this whole industry. Wow. So wow. Uh, most people wouldn't do that. So believe me, when I identify how to get closer and closer, you know, uh, to what I want um, from a fulfillment standpoint and my life's mission, I'll, I'll, I'll make those updates. Okay. But um, I don't know. Uh, but as far as, but I do know that the more I give, the, the better I feel. And so we've got something I've done with my wife the last like two or three years. It's called mm -hmm. Best Ever Causes. Mm -hmm. uh, you can find it bestevercauses.com. And we donate to a nonprofit, a new nonprofit once a month. I donate $1,000, up to 1000 Now it's 1000 When we started like 500 But now it's $1,000 once, once a month to a new nonprofit. And those nonprofits are nominated by anyone. So if anyone listening has a nonprofit, they like to nominate, just go to best ever causes and you can nominate one. And um, so, you know, that, that's, that's a major focus, but I've got a lot of other ways I get back to, I know we're short for time though. Yeah. And I, and I know that that is something that you do, Joe, we're definitely going to include um, the best ever causes in the show notes as well. And, and I would say for all of the going long audience, uh, as you're listening, it is one of the things and, and Joe, uh, I know because I've, I'm a listener of yours, that it is one of the things that you continue to focus on is really how people are, are, are able to give back and everybody does it in different ways. And, uh, and it's great that you are picking uh, a new way to donate and to give back uh, at least through this one platform. And then of course, with your, with your family and your time. Uh, and others. So we will include best ever causes, uh, dot com in the, uh, in the show notes. And so, um, yeah, Joe, and, and like I said, you, you know, uh, I'd, I'd like to keep talking to you forever, but, um, at this point we kind of need to get to the, uh, to the going long final three questions and then, uh, we'll, we'll kind of wrap things up, but, uh, I never ask the question, Joe, unless you tell me that you're ready for me to ask you the question. So are you ready? Sure. Awesome. Okay. Perfect. So, um, Joe, me being here in Barcelona and really connecting people from different places on the globe with us and us experts like yourself really like to know what is your, if we think about it the other way, right. Coming over towards Europe, what is your uh, favorite European city either that you visited or is still on your bucket list? Oh, uh, you know, I, I would say I have not visited London and, um, Yes. Somewhere I want to go. Okay. Awesome. Great place. Great place to visit. Um, second question. Now, Joe, you've shared some of the things with us already. And it, cause one of the things that we always want to look at is that when you're making mistakes, quote unquote, or learning opportunities in life, it, not so much as a mistake, but it's really the way that you, what lesson did you take away from that? And you've already shared a couple of things, but if you could share one lesson uh, with us that would also help um, that can maybe someone doesn't have to pay 100% for the same mistake. Oh, learning some basic terms and applying them, economic versus physical occupancy. I learned a hard lesson that economic is people who are paying to live in your apartment community, physical people are living there. Uh, you want high economic occupancy, physical occupancy isn't as relevant. 
Perfect. So that is a wonderful, very actionable step. And, and you know what, Joe, I, and I know that people, if you are, um, if you're watching, you'll see that uh, there's a, a book um, that I'm going to talk about because it's a positively affected me, the best ever apartment syndication book, where you actually go through a number of the different terms that are important to know um, from a, from a real asset investing uh, perspective. So I definitely appreciate you passing that forward as well. And speaking of books, Joe, and you, I know you're very, very well read. Um, you're also well written. Um, could you share uh, one book that could also help to make an impact uh, on someone? Definitely. Crucial Conversations. It's, I read it a while ago, many, many years ago, but it's made an impact on my life and has many others. Uh, it's on how to have conversations with people when the stakes are high and opinions vary. Uh, if they, the, the main thing to talk about is establishing a mutual purpose and building up from there. There's a lot of actionable things that are helpful. Love that book. So we'll, uh, we'll also include that in the show notes. Crucial Conversations is one that I, I read and, um, uh, reference to as well as a, as a sales leader in the, in the corporate world. So um, listen, Joe, there, there've been so many things that you've shared with us um, from the very beginning, you getting started to work in the W2 job, being able to also work and, uh, and have a goal of, of getting into uh, real estate. Uh, from there, you've been able to affect lives, the hundred children you were talking about uh, before uh, you are shared with us, the way that you identify different issues, help to make the right focus in the, um, the self-reflection to be able to drive forward, build, build things forward, um, and also, you've helped us with thinking about things as, as simple as making sure that you have the right understanding of different vocabulary and different, uh, different terminology. So, um, I want to keep talking to you forever. We, I know we need to get ready and go, but I know there are so many people that are positive in, positively impacted by this conversation. And I know they want to know more about you, Joe. I know you make it really easy, but just in case, could you please help us know what is the best way to find out more about you, about uh, the best ever, uh, best ever brands, as well as uh, Ashcroft Capital? Uh, you can just go to um, my website, joeferrellis.com. And there's tons of stuff that will help you uh, look at how to passively invest in deals um, and you know, just overall real estate knowledge. Okay. Fantastic. So just check out joefairless.com and there's lots and lots of information as Joe said. So helping people to, uh, to understand about uh, the real estate world and also um, passively investing. So uh, Joe, um, on behalf of the entire um, going long audience, I really want to thank you for, for making the time today to, to share your knowledge, your experience with us. Uh, it's been very, very helpful. So thank you very much. Grateful to be on the show. Thanks a lot. Enjoyed okay. it. All right. Awesome. And so for the going along audience, so once again, just want to thank you for joining us. I'm sure that Joe has added lots and lots of value to you today. So feel free to go out and share this with at least two or three other friends. Um, and you know what, we'd love to know what your feedback is. So feel free to leave your reviews. If they want to be five-star reviews as well, um, it's very helpful for us and helpful to, uh, to have other guests like Joe uh, to join the show. And um, until the very next time, I'm looking forward to you, welcoming you back on the very next going long podcast episode. Thank you very much. Wow, don't you love hearing from top-notch experts in the field? You know, when I was getting started, I really wish that I would have had access to such experts. And even more, I wish they would have given me like a really simple list of things to follow so that I could have gotten to my goals much faster and been much happier even sooner. So that's why I've created for you the seven things that you should avoid in order to be successful in long distance investing. And you can pick that up really easily by going to billykeels.com forward slash seven things to avoid. And also, if you liked today's episode, don't forget to leave a five star review. I'm looking forward to seeing you on our very next episode. So go out and make it a great day.